Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976, allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by a copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. Salam alaikum. Mr. Moderator, our distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, our friends and, and our enemies. How, how did the Islam for Europeans end up emerging? You know, what, what was the... the, the... Yes. <laughs> It, it, it was a lot of things. Um, you know, the, there's a couple of points where I look back in my life and uh, I think, yeah, that definitely played a role mm -hmm. um, because I, I could definitely see that there was a gap. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of those, I think the, the, major, um, ex the major gap, the major, you know, like experience that I went through um, was being married to another European descendant uh, convert mm -hmm. and, and whose family was not accept was not was, was on the opposite end of the spectrum. You know, they didn't yeah, yeah. They had negative feelings about Islam and, mm -hmm. um, you know, they didn't accept her, her conversion. But, uh, you know, the fact that, uh, that we found each other, they, her family was okay with that. So mm -hmm. I have this edgy meme. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. so bad. You know, the, the kombucha girl meme where like the first frame was like, <laughs> yeah, the yeah. second frame was like, <laughs> yeah. have, have you seen that, that meme before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I wrote a meme was um, white nationalists when they found out their daughter converts to Islam. And the girl's like, <laughs> and then the second frame is white nationalists when they bring home a white brother. <laughs> <laughs> you got to yeah, send that so, one to me, man. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I'm going to put it on my Facebook, bro. <laughs> So yeah, it's pretty much the only way that we could have survived as uh, and keep our faith, really. Um, but uh, um, that's um, you know I don't go into detail that much about it. It, it came to an end for several reasons, mm. um, not some of which has to do anything with the Muslim community mm. or uh, you know like rejecting Islam per se. But you know, it could start to feel that the um, societal structures are simply not there when you do not have a community. It's difficult to fit in. It was easier for me, me to fit in for some reasons. My family was accepting of it, of my conversion. And, mm. um, you know, like I think on the, on the brother's side, um, there's more brothers to begin with at a mosque. Yeah. Um, so you're interacting with more, um, there's fewer cultural barriers. I think, um, the immigrant Muslim community, they, the brothers have to deal more with the greater wider community on a regular basis. Mm. Um, so they feel like they need to interact more where as for sisters, I think it's much more difficult. I hijab definitely. Yeah. You know, Cause like, you know, like they, you know, like they, like a lot of these sisters, when they convert their families are like, if you wear hijab, we're kicking you out of the house. We're disowning you. Um, yep. you know, um, yep, that's okay. and then, and then they wear hijab and they go to the mosque mm -hmm. and then the, you know, they hear the khutbah or they hear people talking like that. You're, you're not wearing hijab properly. You know, so it's even though they don't realize the struggle that it took to wear this mm. and, you know, uh, so that's a big disconnect, I think. And that's part of the reason that's I just sort of percolated in my head that, you know what, I think something needs to happen. And I, I at first it was just all about, you know, just converts in general, which I think is very important because mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter what background you're from. I think converts uh, you know, they, they need help. I just think the mosque, when they try to help converts out, it's just basically using a square peg for a round hole. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, they'll spend loads, boatloads of money trying to help, trying to acclimate, uh, converts into the community. Um, but it's just, it's just not resolving the, the issue. And it, what it does is, especially for, for white converts, you know, they, they roll out the red carpet for us and it, but the, there's a lot of problems with that because you're not, um, if you're not addressing the main issue, uh, it's just, you're just basically throwing money down the drain. I'll give an example of this. We, this was after the, the, the divorce. Um, we uh, met a brother um, who had just converted to Islam uh, and, you know, his, 
he, you know, his wife was really leery about it. Um, you know, he didn't have, didn't know any non-Muslims in his, he had all non-Muslims in his family and they weren't really accepting of his conversion at all. Yeah. Um, and right after he converts the, the imam was like, we were going for Umrah actually. And he, he gave this brother a free Umrah trip, mm -hmm. you know, like this is like two, three grand and this brother just converted. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't know the monastic of uh, Umrah. He doesn't know how he doesn't know how to do any of this stuff. And yeah, yeah. you know, they put him on this Umrah trip. They gave him a gas card to go to the mosque more often. Wow, lunch all that. Yeah, I know. But the thing was, this I brother never got no Umrah trip. Umrah trip. <laughs> What's that? I never got no Umrah trip. I know. Yeah. <laughs> and that's another thing. It just that's another reason why I'm against you know this white saviorism. Uh, you know, because it's just, it just creates more animosity, mm. um, and unfairness. And I, I, I don't think money is, is the real issue. Mm. Um, so when he came back from Umrah, you know, he was so depressed because this brother was drinking, like he drank alcohol mm. for years mm. and he quit cold Turkey when he converted. Mm -hmm. And once he came back from Umrah, he just felt so depressed because the, the Muslim community was giving him so much trying to quote unquote integrate him. But once mm. he went back on the bottle. Uh, you know, he just felt so much shame there's, that he just didn't want to. Yeah, there's back. no, um, whatchamacallit, no support. Yeah. There's no support. And and uh, this is why, uh, and like like what you're doing with the Islam for Europeans, something, something like that has to be done, right? Especially for white converts, you know, and for converts in general. Because converts understand the backgrounds that they're coming from. And these people who have, like, centuries of cultural... Um, uh, like this, this cultural baggage that they carry with them and to try to impose it on, on converts without actually knowing what the Sahaba they themselves went through. There were Sahaba that were, you know, after the verses were revealed about not drinking alcohol, they were still drinking alcohol. They're alcoholics. There's a Sahaba mm -hmm. like this, yeah. right? If there, was, there was Sahaba that were, you know, they were tested with things, right? So, but at the same time, they had the support system because... You know, you have you have your, the prophet says you have the Sahaba around you, whatever. You know, when Muslims, when Muslim converts, you know, slip or fall up or fall off, right? It's all of a sudden. You, it's it's not like try to pick the brother up. No, it's it's exile the brother. Yeah. You understand? You know, yeah. and uh, you know, that's that's like a massive. Uh, disconnect right there, like you keep, like you mentioned before, right? But I don't know. I'm just babbling. But <laughs> no, no, I, I completely agree with you. And uh, you know, I, I would even um, uh, take it take it a step further in saying that um, it, it's almost like to try to assimilate converts into a totally new community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, would take an incredible amount of effort. I mean, just imagine if, like, all of a sudden, 100, you know, people and in, in one town or city and ended up converting to Islam, all taking their Shahada and 50 of them are women. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to, if you really want to, you know, assimilate them into a new community, the amount of money you'd have to spend, it would just be astronomical. Like you'd have to provide housing for the sisters mm -hmm. to get kicked out if they don't wear hijab, um, you know, and so. Uh, and well, these are the type of things that you have to be willing to do, right? Especially when yeah. it comes if we if we have a if you have a community like you say we have a community, as you know as you understand if you keep hearing these stories about converts, not just getting kicked out but like violence being inflicted on them, you know what I mean like uh, you know people becoming homeless, all kinds of crazy stuff, man. And a lot of these converts they convert to Islam with jahiliya baggage. You know you have mm -hmm. like the brother you said he was a heavy drinker, right? You have but you have uh, people who smoking weed and or in the streets or whatnot, you know, because like these, these are like real things, right? So there has to be some sort of support system for them, right? So, and born, yeah. go ahead. So, and born Muslims are, you know, some of them do this too. Mm -hmm. It's just, they don't, the, the, the thing I hear, I think, you know, what we're talking about is very, very important. Um, you know, like it's, it's a huge issue and the ulama, they don't realize this. They don't, they're not on the ground. So they only see the finished product. They just see, you know, the convert that made it. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of converts that are struggling out there. And I think, you know, a major issue is um, for born Muslims, if they're not practicing at all, everyone still consider, considers them to be Muslim, you know, yeah. like even if they're drinking and not praying and going to strip clubs and, you know, like mm -hmm. I know some, when I converted some born Muslims, they, their way of practicing uh, during Ramadan was they didn't fast, 
they would still go to strip clubs, but when they went to strip clubs, they wouldn't drink alcohol. Like that was their, <laughs> That's their idea of fasting. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas cool. for a lot of converts, it's like if you miss Juma prayer once, it's like, oh, where have you been, brother? Is this guy going to leave Islam? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think without a sub community, mm. you know, like it's very difficult to uh, get adjusted. And one of the things that I, that resonated with me that, that sort of sparked this, uh, you know, like idea of um, starting Islam for Europeans was I was giving an open, uh, it was at an open house and we were volunteering our time. Mm. And, uh, you know, I was paired up with this one sister from Pakistan and um, they had all these like boards as, you know, like teaching about Islam and the Quran and the prophets and things like that. And there's this one older white gentleman, he came in, you know, we were, you know, explaining things to him about Islam and, and then he, the issue of marriage came up. He said, well, how do you guys get married? Mm -hmm. And the sister from Pakistan, he's like, she's like, well, you know, what we'll do is, uh, you know, the families, uh, they'll, our family will be heavily involved. You know, they will look into finding a you know, potential suitor, uh, you know, that's compatible uh, with their son or their daughter. Uh, you know, they'll meet together. The families will meet together. Um, you know, there'll be no touching you know, chaperone both. And then they'll just discuss, you know, like if, if these two people are compatible or not. And then if it doesn't work out, you know, if then we'll, you know, they'll try to find somebody else in the community and, and, and things like that. So that, that's basically the, the, the marriage process and everything. There's no dating. And then the, the, the gentleman was like, Oh, okay. Fascinating. And then he looked at me, he's like, well, what do you guys do? <laughs> and then I, I just didn't have an answer for him. And I just thought, you know what? And then it took me a while and to, for that to percolate in my head, I'm just like, yeah, I mean, without a sub community, uh, converts are just basically left on their own to do kind of do these things. And I think that's why a lot of convert sisters, they don't have a Muslim family, you know, and they don't ask for anything for a maher. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no, and we don't date. So mm -hmm. there's no, no one to protect them. So it, it opens the door to uh, suitors that may not have their best interests uh, at heart. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of convert born disaster marriages because yeah. you know they didn't take these one second one them. second spubs Wait. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah so yeah i mean that's uh, definitely these all these things they all play a role um the and, and you know what I, we're the thing is i there is a lot of opposite there is some opposition to uh, Islam for Europeans that I, I was hearing uh, from some Muslims, and I think they kind of misunderstand where we're coming from because they're looking at it as, uh, you know, oh, well, I mean, white uh, converts are just given so much. Now you guys want to ask for even more, and you want to have your own sub community. You want to divide the community further, mm -hmm. and we're, we don't want to be like that at all. What we're doing is we're fulfilling a major responsibility that we have as European descendant uh, converts that we have. Uh, sort of shirked. And mm. I think by not forming a sub community like the African American community has, mm. like uh, Islam and Spanish has also done, we actually did a great disservice uh, mm. to the greater Muslim community because, you know, like, are those people who are protesting at mosques, you know, the, the MAGA hats, you know, who are, you know, like spray, fang, spray painting graffiti on walls and throwing pigs heads at mosques and mm. ripping the hijabs off of our sisters. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. protect women's rights. Sharia law takes women's power away from them. It gives men right to kill them. We're in America. We are in USA. We should follow our constitution, not Sharia law. That is not our law. The Muslims would love to turn Dallas, Texas into Dearborn, Michigan. These people who are supportive of Sharia law are looking for special treatment in various cities. They're asking for safe spaces so that they can practice in secret Sharia law. Je suis pas mal. 
dans ce que j'ai fait. Comme j'ai dit, il y a des gens qui vont être sauvés, là. puis la famille aussi va être sauvée. Those are our aunts, those are our uncles, those mm -hmm. are uh, the people we play tennis with. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's our responsibility to lead, you know, not exclusively, but lead Dawa efforts to, to those people. And, yeah, and you know, we'd I'm, love I'm to very, do that. I'm very happy that you mentioned that because that's actually, first of all, it's, it's very brave and it just happens to be the truth, right? And, yeah. uh, you know, like, and of course, these are your people. So you know how, you yourself know how to address them best. And when people kind of brush these issues under the rug, and say, you know, it's some sort of simple-minded racist or whatever, you know what I mean? Like uh, people who who don't have, you know, any, like they're like crazy Trump supporters are doing all of this, this these kind of things. You, you are right there. You know how to reason with these people. You know how to, you know, you know what, what, how to talk to these people. And it's better for them to have somebody who can talk to them than for, for somebody like me. They're not going to, you know, even have a conversation with you but someone like you who's with, who is from that community can actually reach them and talk to them right mm -hmm. so this this type of uh, outlet is important for that as well right so mm -hmm. but that that's uh that takes a lot of courage to admit that kind of thing you know what i mean so yeah yeah and even because i look at it this way you know when we convert to islam let's look at it as a scale of your non-muslim uh family and community as a scale from negative 100 to positive 100 right mm -hmm. so when you convert you might have family members that are at negative 100 like they want to kill you they don't they want to kick you out of their house they want to cut you out of the will mm -hmm. you have others who are like you know negative 50 negative 40 uh, you know they are confused you know they you know they don't want to oppress you in any way but they still don't like it there are others who are neutral there are others who are very positive like my family you know, like, uh, like even my dad's friends, they wanted to see me pray, like, they just like, cause they had interacted with Muslims and stuff and, and they knew I was Muslim. So I was like, how about I show you guys how we pray? So I was just like, yeah, sure. So I brought them to the basement. They still had, you know, the guy still had a beer and the lady, his wife's girlfriend still had a glass of wine in her hand. It's like, you know what? It's, it's important. So I prayed to her in front of them. Just like, wow, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. So, um, it, it's all about shifting them more into the, onto the positive, uh, okay side and that takes a lot of patience and a lot of effort and you're not going to be able to talk like you're in some Zachary Nike lecture I mean like a lot of it is just your adab and just mm -hmm. being around those people and near the end of you know my first marriage like the people who were opposed to Islam in that family they started to eventually come around like they wanted to know how my Umar trip was and mm -hmm. um you know like um you, you saw some of the uh, some of the some of the changes you know, for those who don't have any non-Muslim family members, you know, like I can understand and sympathize with where they're coming from because in their minds, when they walk down the street, every white person is a potential minus 100. They don't know if this person's gonna say something or try to rip their hijab off or, you know, mm -hmm. like go to a Trump rally. So, you know, like it, this, that fear. Um, mm -hmm. So I understand where they're coming from. Um, yeah. You know, I understand why they would look at a group like ours and go, you know, well, what's the point of engaging, you know, with these people? Mm. Um, you know, they're not going to change anyway. But some others are just like, yeah, I can see the importance of it. But a lot of the times they're just kind of reluctant to, you know, uh, reach out and talk to anyone about anything, really, uh, even let alone religion, let alone Islam. So mm. I always try to keep that in mind that, you know, um, you know, we're, we're a group that, ha that has benefit for all potential stakeholders, including the greater uh, Muslim community. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll even admit, cause I saw, you know, some, a, a brother, even before I met you, uh, put me onto your website. He's like, do not look at these people, you know, <laughs> it's like, look at these, look at these white people, what they're doing, you know? <laughs> so I, I went to the, to the website and I checked it out. I was like, you know, because I, I, that's kind of my thing, you know, I, I'll, I'll vet stuff first before I make any type of, um, you know, type of like, a, like ruling or decision or judgment on people, you know, I, I'm just not going to go with the flow, right? I, I, I personally, I can't, I can't do that, right? So of course, no. there's a lot of that's suspicion true. surrounding white people because you, because you know, <laughs> you know, right? Yes. right? So, so 
uh, I looked at it and I was like, I don't really see a problem with this. You know, even, even one time I saw on YouTube, this guy from the South, right? A Muslim brother, he's a convert. And he started, um, uh, what do you, he's it's Muslims for rednecks or something like that, right? Or Islam, or Islam for rednecks. And, 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 and I, I, I can't remember his name, man, but I saw him and I was listening to him talk, Islam for rednecks. And I knew theoretically you could be a white Muslim, but where I grew up, I've never seen a white Muslim person. Thank you, sir. My grandparents on both sides of my family were farmers in rural Mississippi. Black eyed peas and cornbread, you can't get much lower than that. I definitely went through a, a lot of phases of being unaware of injustice and then seeing injustice, but not knowing how to process that. I'm probably the only person here whose grandfather taught them how to tie a noose. He gave me some antique money. Uh -huh. This was used by the Confederate States, and this one was when the state... I was the first generation of my family to go to an integrated school. I didn't have black friends growing up, African-American friends growing up, until I got in high school. And then interacting with different people and seeing that um, there's good and bad in all people. There's beautiful people that come in all different shades. Really, it was really confusing. Things didn't really add up. Southern hospitality and Islamic generosity, they blend perfectly. The Andy Griffith Show, that's a good example of everything I aspire to be as a Muslim. Just look at the Andy Griffith Show like hard work and believing in God and honoring your, your family. And people that are rednecks, redneck doesn't mean something negative. That's a badge of honor. So I made a group called the Society of Islamic Rednecks. And I was thinking, how can I share Islam with people from my background? 1,600 people joined this group on Facebook. And it's just funny. We're working on the Islamic commentary to Leonard Skinner, Simple Man. Like, and it's 61 people. But uh, Halal Barbecue? 5,014. <laughs> on the little blurb, it says there's many positive parts of redneck culture. But we just seek to purify that of racism and sexism. I was like, that that, that idea is ingenious. Like, I, like I, I, so that's kind of like how I, I saw Islam for Europeans, but the, you know, because you're the more Canadian, you know, less in your face style, but it's pretty much the same thing what this guy was doing, right? And mm -hmm. when he went and he asked the black community, what do you think of Islam for rednecks? And they were like, they were not down with it. I'm like, what are you guys saying? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And, it, you know, yeah. I was like, because it's a cultural thing. You know, when you ask a black Southerner, what do you think about this thing for rednecks? In their mind, they're thinking about, when they hear redneck, they instantly go into um, co Confederate flag mode. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's, what, that's, what, that's what we hear as black people, right? But there's a whole culture behind being a redneck, right? There's, a, there's, there's of course, there's the co Confederate flag, but not every redneck considers themselves like that it's like an entire culture behind it you know with hunting and fishing whatever these guys do right they're with their trucks and whatnot right this is this redneck culture right so i was like that's ingenious right so yeah so i was like i, I was like eh, i didn't really see anything wrong with it at the time and then i then another brother told me like no his this brother's real cool you should talk to him so i can find i talked to you and i was like yeah this brother's cool <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, and I understand where they're they're coming from. I mean, uh, you know, like the um, the black brothers and sisters who you know were just turned off by the idea of of uh, redneck Muslims. I I totally get you know where they're coming from. Why they would be reluctant to support an idea like that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it's just um, that's why we have to be very you know like as Islam for Europeans progresses. You know, like um, I always ask for feedback from the, you know, uh, the black uh, community because, you know, there's going to be things that are going to raise eyebrows. I mean, we're going to reach out to people that 
you know, like if, you know, like uh, that are going to be racist and are going to, you know, head organizations that are racist. Mm -hmm. um, and we're representing the entire Ummah and the Muslim community. And, you know, like um, we want to make sure that those, those, those voices are heard um, as we're progressing uh, with this idea. I mean, it's nothing new really in the, if you look at Islamic history, you know, like all these groups that are now, you know, like uh, mostly are all Muslim, you know, they had people within their own society that- 959, New York City, New York. The South Tower of the World Trade Center collapses to the ground in approximately 10 seconds. 29 minutes later, the North Tower follows suit, collapsing in approximately 10 seconds. Later that evening at 520, World Trade Center 7, a 47-story office building 300 feet away from the North Tower, suddenly collapses. The building's tenants included the CIA, Department of Defense, IRS, Secret Service, and Rudy Giuliani's emergency bunker. And the SEC was using it to store three to 4,000 files related to numerous Wall Street investigations. Although every single building surrounding Building 7 stood intact, it fell straight down into a convenient little pile in six seconds. Official explanation? Falling debris from the Twin Towers created an internal fire which ignited several fuel tanks inside the building. If this is true, then it would be the third building in history to collapse because of a fire. The first two would be the Twin Towers.